Hi, everyone, and welcome to this Brain Talks. Today, we'll have some exciting speakers for you, and the program is as follows. First, Arnoldi Frugesi from the Oslo University Hospital will have a talk on COVID-19 modeling. Secondly, Thomas Lange from Sintef Digital Health will have a talk on AI in radiology. Then we'll take a five minute break and we will be back with Jonathan Whitlock from NTNU who will have a talk on neurophysiology. Lastly, Jonas Adler from Google DeepMind will have a talk on how we can use artificial intelligence to improve human health. So without further ado, please welcome Arnoldo Frigesi. COVID-19 epidemics. And when I discussed um, uh, my talk with um, uh, uh, Joachim from Brain Antenu, he asks me, but are you sure that this is AI, this stuff that you're doing? And this is a fair question, Joachim. And uh, I start with uh, a bit um, uh, putting um, concepts in place. So this is my world of, of my look of um, in, into AI and data science. So it's, um, it's intersecting statistics and mathematics with computer science, and then the substantive science or sector uh, or area that, that you are concerned with and, and that provides the data and provides the questions. And when you do this intersection, you find machine learning, bioinformatics, biostatistics, and in the middle data science. And my talk is in here, in the middle there. Okay, and if you want to find out where AI is in my, in my uh, um, understanding of the world, then we need another bubble which is engineering, and then we get AI in the middle with robotics. So uh, the government uh, also yesterday um, takes very important decisions for the country uh, in order to control the pandemics. And uh, we in uh, Feldkets Institute, we have um, a precise task. And our task is to predict the number of uh, infected individuals, which is called the incidence, predict the numbers of, in, of people who require hospitalization, in particular intensive care units. And uh, to do this, we also will estimate the total number of infected so far, the prevalence, how many people got uh, corona so far in Norway. And an important number and parameter that you all have heard about is the reproduction number R. And this we have to estimate and predict at national level and at Fylke level, at county level. And, and all this also in the light of the vaccination program that is start and in the light of the new variants of the virus that are coming into Norway. It's a difficult task, but we are helped by important data sets, data sources. So the data sources that exist are at, at municipality level, 356 in Norway, and it's the total number of people tested and the total number of, uh, of those who are positive every day the total of uh, imported cases from abroad that are not infected in Norway, and the total of new admission to hospital because of the COVID-19. There are also other type of data that we are not using, the, the, the ICU admission and the total deaths. And then there is an important other source of data that we find very useful, and it's the description of how people move in Norway, because moving means that you take the virus from one place to another. Let me try to say, first of all, that it is really, really important to understand the origin of data. And an important task in artificial intelligence and in everything what we're doing is to understand every single data point, what it really means and what information it contains. For example, here you see a plot of the negative tested. It's the, it's the blue one. You see the positive tested down there, the red one, and you see the percentage tested per week. And these are all important things. The number of, of, of positive tested is important, the absolute number, because in Oslo today we have so many, for example, that the uh, contact tracing can be delayed, which is a problem. But the percentage is really telling us something really fundamentally because, of course, we find positives if we test more. So there is a connection between the positive tested and the to total tested. So for example, you can easily find in the press uh, uh, articles that, that sh say that the number of corona spitted in Oslo has triplicated the last week. And when we look to the percentages, we see that it has 
uh, been a factor five, for example. And this is understanding the fundamental information in data. It's simple things, right? But it's important. So here you see another piece of data. This is the uh, number of uh, tested from the beginning of the epidemics divided into the ones that have been tested um, for the first time and uh, the ones that are tested multiply. I think that today a lot of people get two, three, four tests if they, if they are in quarantine, for example. And of course, we have to count only one because these are repetition that don't tell us much more. So we have to split the number of tests in these various components. Only then they become informative for the purpose of describing how the epidemics develops in our country. The mobility that we have in our models is captured by the mobility of mobile phones. Telenur, that, that has a, a, a market share of about half of Norway, um, provides us with um, mobility data that tells us where the mobile phones are and where they move every six hours um, uh, between municipalities. So, so the data are, in these six hours, 356 people moved from Trondheim to Oslo and so on, among all these 356 uh, municipalities. A nice matrix every six hours. And because of privacy, if the counts go below 20, they are censored. Um, and, and these data are in itself very interesting. So here you see the data from March until uh, a week ago. It's uh, the number of movements out from um, the main cities in, in, in Norway. I think the red one is, in fact, Oslo. What you see is that an enormous drop in mobility after the first lockdown in March. And then here's the summer and the vacation. People move. Lots of people went to Tromsø because they couldn't go to Mallorca. And, and, and here you see something very interesting. Here you see in December, the week, the first week of December, a dramatic increase in, in movements that is connected to shopping and to fill up shops with things that people should buy. And here where, is where we are. You see, we are quite, I mean, it's a, it's a, we are lower than before, but we are quite high. And Trondheim is completely in the middle here. Uh, then we, when, then we take the 5 million people that live in Norway and put them in their municipalities. And, and, and this is where they live and this is where they start and this is where they move from and go back, according to um, the description that, that the Telenor data will give us, not individually, but, uh, but as, as a population. But here there is, again, thinking to data, students are a problem because students are living in Trondheim, but they are resident in, 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 with their families very often. And so if you get sick in, in Trondheim, you will still be counted in Oslo if, you, if you're coming from there. So difficulties and inconsistencies that are important to remember. If XIJT is the matrix that, that uh, tells us how many people moved from I Commune I to Commune J at time T between T and T minus one. So this is this beautiful matrix. Because you want you in principle conserve people, they don't disappear, there is no exit from the system, then this equation that you that you read there must be true for every time point and every IJ. But it is not true. It is not true because people escape the Telenor data because the phones are off, they don't work, they are not connected. You, you you do things that are that are diff 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 different than expected. And, and um, these errors in this equality, they're problematic because suddenly uh, you can start to deplete smaller municipalities because you want to move people out from the municipalities and there's nothing there. So you have to regularize these matrices. You have to do so that you preserve populations. And then you do some mathematics and understand that this means that the rows of the sums and the rows of the columns should be the same. And then you find by doing some quadratic programming with linear constraints, you find the matrices that are closest to the one that you get from, from Telenur, but preserve the population. These are the ones that we use for mobility. Then we have to describe by mathematically how the infection um, happens in, in the country. And these are these famous SER model. There are very many, everybody uses them now, who, those who do modeling of the, of the epidemics. They, are, they, are, they have um, uh, compartments and people are susceptible in the beginning and then they can be exposed, they get infected, but they're not infectious. Some will, re will remain asymptomatic all the time. It goes here on this side. Some become symptomatic on this side here. And, um, and uh, when you're asymptomatic, you can still infect the others, but this happens much less. 
And there are lots of probabilities and parameters that we have to describe in this model to start to understand how it works. Imagine a simulation code that will describe and, and simulate the trajectory of the epidemics in Norway until today. For example, we need to, we need to know how much time people remain in non, um, exposed but non-infectious. What is the probability if you become infected that you're asymptomatic or symptomatic? This probability is today fixed to be 40% comes from the literature, but a couple of days ago, we understand that it should be really 30% because more knowledge is there. We should change it, right? And, and when you are asymptomatic, then you are infectious. Yes, you are, but only 10% of what you are if you are symptomatic. And then there is this very famous and, and crucial parameter beta, which is called a reproduction number, essentially, which is the probability that you, you transmit your infection if you, are, if you are infected to other people. And R is the number of that you that you infect. Differential equations, stochastic differential equations, govern how the uh, how the the, pro, the dynamics and the disease is modeled. They're very simple. They can be solved easily. And then I have to add add pieces of information. So how do I send my people to hospital? Because I will need to send my um, in my simulation, I will need to hospitalize people because only in this way I can compare my model with the, with the data about the hospitalization. The date of the hospitalization is here. I want a model that produce hospitalization that are similar to the data. This is called often calibration or inference. And I need a model here. And then I, uh, and, 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 and the model, I need also a model that says how long people stay in hospital. Well, okay, how much time does it take from symptom onset to hospital? We find out by looking to the very strong and very good Norwegian registries that this is, takes about 7.6 days with a certain distribution and negative binomial. And if you go to hospital, what is the danger that you need uh, uh, um, uh, ICU? It's it's about um, it's it's described here. It's not much, right? But it's 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 here. And then if you are in this line, it takes more time in hospital and so on. Then I need, in order to compare our simulation with the test data, I need to say who is going to be tested and who is going to be found tested. So I will I will have to model the probability to detect a positive case pi t. And this pi t is a logistic uh, model that says at time t, this, this is um, a certain fixed factor plus something that depends on the number of tests actually performed on day t. Because if you perform a lot of tests, then there will be higher probability to detect a positive person and so on. So these are, these are important points. Then we can't estimate this beta t f easily. It's a, it's a, it's a, a number different for every filter and for every day. So the first model that we run simplifies the situation by saying that, okay, we are not going to change every day. We change it in chunks. So here between in this period of the year, we have one number for every filter. Here we have another one number and so on. These are called change points. And we put them in, in the right places. We put them when the government makes decision because then we can imagine that these, uh, these transition probabilities change. Um, and here are the results that we got uh, today. So you see for, for whole Norway, this is results uh, for the whole country. The current um, uh, change point is put on the 2nd of March, a couple of weeks ago. And the estimate of the reproduction number is 1.3 with a confidence interval or a Bayesian credibility. Interval. This is Bayesian, in fact, 1.2, 1.5. Um, this is uh, an estimate of the reproduction number changing every day which is also something that we do by uh, using something called sequential Monte Carlo. Um, you see here that in the last days, we, sh we see a small drop. This is a really important thing because it could well be that the intervention in Oslo in March have produced an improvement uh, um, and, and in, in, in Viken have produced an improvement. We, we don't know it. Yes, there is uncertainty, of course. Here you see the numbers in the rest of the country. Trunnelag, where is it? Here we, we you see Trunnelag has a, quite a big uncertainty. We it's between zero and one point two, something like that. The median is zero point seven, but it's it's lower than a lot of other filters, and uh, and uh, um, and and this is of course good. Um, predictions here we have the data points are the red dots here. This is the new uh, admissions to hospital. Um, it's going down. It's going up here again, and this is our prediction here. What will happen the next three weeks? Um, I'll conclude now. I have 
one minute, I hope, two minutes, by trying to summarize where are we with this uh, uh, science that you're doing, and maybe also with artificial intelligence in this period of emergency. And I go back to the UK, Boris Johnson on the 12th of March, press conference, he says, he said, it is in inevitable that most people will get the disease. So we should let the epidemic proceed to allow 60% of the population to become infected and build herd immunity. Three days after, on the 16th of March, a very famous uh, uh, epidemiologist and, and statistician, Neil Ferguson from Imperial College and, the, and his colleagues, they produce what is famously called the Report 9, which studies what is the impact of doing or not doing things in a country on mortality. And this is a stochastic model, very similar to the one that I showed you now. And the result of his work on that day is that if you do nothing, then 500,000 people will die in the UK. If you do a lot, only 20,000 people will die. And a couple of days after the Ministry of, of, uh, of Health in the UK, he says keeping the total number of COVID-19 deaths under 20,000 would be a good outcome. And a couple of days after the UK is in lockdown. Science has an enormous impact, but science is still in this phase quite imprecise. This famous report nine has been changed and changed and corrected and corrected and discussed. And uh, also our uh, work, which has been important on the 12th of March, for, for example, but also yesterday when the important decisions were taken, this piece of work has changed and changed and changed. And we have produced an update note that we that has now eight pages that contains all the changes and all the corrections that we have done to our models because we understand more and we understand better. Science is changing. It's moving from being evidence-based, which means that as a scientist, you take all the available knowledge that you have now and all the available data and you produce results that are final in the current situation. This is what it has been so far, but, but it's not like this. I'd like to call this evidence-making science. Models are just starting points and not the final truth. Models change and methods change on the basis of knowledge that is changes and also needs. And the public, you are influencing us what we do. And uncertainty is so big that results really only open playgrounds where decision and discussion can take place. And these playgrounds are really, really important because data allow you to move here freely and use other type of politically, ethical, economical arguments. Um, what about artificial intelligence in emergency? Think to what is happening with AstraZeneca. And I ask you, and here these are more questions than answer. Could a monitoring algorithm recognize the clusters of strange cases more rapidly and more better than, than, than um, for example, what has happened in the UK, where I've been waiting for weeks to understand if there are clusters there? But if there is such an algorithm, would the public trust this algorithm? And even more, how would we test it outside the pandemic? Where would we test it? How could we do it properly? And another important point is that when you are in emergency, you don't have time to do things well. There is no time to collect and curate a large trained data set to run your deep learning. You don't have the time. There's even no time to test and debug your code properly. So how do you communicate to the public that your results might be in fact wrong and tomorrow I'm going to change them? These are all questions um, and we try to answer them. And if you want to work together with that, these nice people, then you can email me and try to help us to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Arnoldo. We have a question uh, here for you. And the question is as follows. What are your expectations of the number of infected by the virus after Easter? So um, I think that the situation now is quite bad. Uh, 1.3 means that everything is increasing. Um, so. So in the next three weeks, the situation is going to be worse in hospitals. Uh, this famous UK variant, the B117, is, uh, um, is completely uh, predominant in Oslo, but not in other places in Norway. So it's still growing. And this comes with an increase of the, of the, of the R number because it is more aggressive. So uh, 
I imagine that the situation is going to, is, is going to be worse, but on the other hand, we have all these interventions, social distancing, um, uh, two meters instead of one meters and so on, very good and important uh, aspects that will, on the other hand, reduce things. So I'm, I, I think that I want to be a bit optimistic and, and imagine that uh, uh, we, will, we will see a better situation in three, four weeks, maybe in five weeks, we will have um, an R number that is maybe 1.1, 1.2, and vaccination is, is going up. And these two things together, they allow us to have a summer, I think. And, mm -hmm. and, and normal classes in Trondheim from 15th of August. Let's hope so. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is uh, Thomas Lange. Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm going to try to share my presentation. You can hear me and see my slides now, probably. Yes, we see your slides. Perfect. And we hear you. Well. So thank you for the invitation. And uh, I'm going to talk about, or I was asked to talk about AI in radiology. So that's going to be a minor part of it, because what we use mainly AI for is to interpret images and uh, process images, radiological images, but we use them for diagnostics and therapy mainly. So my name is, uh, as you can see there, and I lead a center, a national center for ultrasound image guided therapy at St. Olaf's Hospital. It's in close collaboration with uh, Sintef and NTNU. And we have been working in this center since uh, 1996, more or less. It was uh, changed in 2011, mainly. And we have had some spin-offs uh, companies that you can see on the far right side of this slide. There's some examples of spin-offs from this activity. Uh, actually, the GE Ultrasound was part of this uh, collaboration between Sintef and NTNU that was spun off as an Ultrasound company and later bought by GE, as you know. Here are just a list and uh, some snapshots from the activity and uh, the main clinical fields of research and development and innovation that we work on. Uh, I'm not uh, within the time frame I have today. I'm not going to be able to show you many examples. So I've chosen to show you more deeply one example, and that's from bronchoscopy in, in green on the left side. But uh, as you see from the snapshots, we are also involved in, in uh, image, guidance, image guidance during uh, different kinds of surgery, uh, decision support systems in various clinical disciplines, and so on. Before I get to that, I'll just mention that uh, maybe many of you know, but not all of you know, that Sintef is a not-for-profit research institute, and St. Olaf's is one of the five university hospitals in uh, Norway, covering a base population of about uh, slightly under a million people. Uh, we recently, together with NTNU and uh, AI Lab, uh, we actually got uh, appointed a new Gemini Center uh, for medical imaging research and AI, together with uh, you guys at uh, Glossogen and several uh, partners at Donut AI in Trondheim. We, we found out that we basically have it all in Trondheim to establish a center like this. Uh, we have uh, research groups that are world leading in different fields. We have excellent uh, access to good students. We have uh, domain knowledge within this field of healthcare. And we have state of the art within AI and uh, large uh, databases and data access, uh, which is being of course, uh, part of the barrier to get enough data out and to be able to work with all the data in an easy way. So this is being solved and this Gemini Center will be an important part of that work. Uh, in case there is uh, very little time at the end, I usually start by giving you my main message at the beginning, which is uh, some people find strange, but uh, the main message with my talk is basically that artificial intelligence is not gonna replace medical doctors as far as we can see. The main thing is that this technology will be used by doctors to assist them and take some workload off them. And the medical professionals who use AI will basically replace those who will not use AI in the future. Uh, quite a few people think that this is the, the scenario that will play out. Anyway, you all know this. Uh, it is also true in medical image analysis that the, the number of publications are increasing exponentially. Uh, since 2015, 16, when it uh, basically started really to, to increase. And uh, there are already, this is already an old publication, it's from 2017, showing some areas where deep learning can uh, surpass human performance when it comes to interpretation 
and detection of uh, objects and diseases in medical images. Uh, we actually work with quite a few of these, uh, these examples that are shown here, uh, both from, uh, from uh, neurosurgery, segmenting and predicting scenarios in neural brain tumors. We work with the airways. I'm going to show you examples from bronchoscopy and this work. And nodule classification is one thing that we implemented that works really nicely. We, we trained the, the, the models on open data sets and then adapt them to, to local data as soon as we get access to it. And in uh, digital pathology, I think AI has a ma very major role in the future. And we have, a, we have two big projects on, on digital pathology at the moment uh, and AI analysis. Uh, so moving a little bit uh, away from radiology, but I'll come back to radiological images. We are following this uh, sort of evolution in therapy where you start uh, on the left side from open surgery, going to minimal access surgery with keyhole surgery in the abdomen, as one example, to the future where you will have much more localized treatment and uh, non-invasive therapy. Uh, you deliver the energy to a target inside the body. In many, you can do this in many different ways through needles, probes, or even non-invasively using ultrasound, therapeutic ultrasound, for instance. Also robotics is part of this picture. I should mention it because it's, uh, it's something that uh, a lot of the groups that we uh, collaborate with work on and we are working with it. And it's uh, currently there's only one uh, robotic solution or it's called robotic solution. I, will, I could explain to you a lot around that, but it's not a robot. It's more a telemetric manipulator, if you will. But there are robots uh, appearing now on the market, true robots that can work autonomously. The thing is the, the level of autonomy that these uh, machines can, uh, can show is uh, everything from no, where the surgeon does all the work to assistance, to task and uh, autonomy. And then you have so on until you have full autonomy, which is uh, something we don't uh, expect to see in the near future at all, actually, not in surgery, but task autonomy is something that we are looking for and something that uh, we are testing even. Um, the future will consist of robots together with humans and you have to find a way for them to work together. So you have to avoid collisions. You have to be able to give the robots uh, sight. We have a big uh, project uh, called the RUMO in uh, Sintef together with uh, several partners that we, where we do robotics for moving objects. And in this scenario, you use imaging to detect the surface where you're gonna place an ultrasound probe you use the images and use AI technology to detect features in the image, structures in the image, to know where to localize what you're looking for and to scan, let's say if it's for a diagnostic follow-up scan. And the, the advantage for using robotics and AI in this context is that you get a very robust and repeatable uh, way of doing things. You avoid some, in, some observer uh, variability and you get a, a solution that is uh, automatic, of course, and you can, uh, you can save some man hours there also. Um, a lot of the things we do uh, in our group uh, at Sintef and TNU and St. Olaf is that we work on uh, software development uh, using AI techniques that we implement in this platform. The platform is open source uh, since 2015. It's called Custus X, and you can find it online and, and have a look at it. It's uh, free to download and use for anything. You can even download it and sell it if you want to. Uh, but one example of a field where we use this uh, that I promised to show you a little bit more detail on is uh, bronchoscopy. In uh, bronchoscopy, the, the pulmonologist, the doctor, is interested to find uh, a lesion inside the lungs where he wants to or she wants to take a sample to diagnose uh, a suspicious lesion, to find out whether it's cancer, how dangerous the cancer is, and so on. You can determine a lot of this from just the images, and this is something we are working on, but some lesions you have to sample to determine uh, the correct treatment uh, from that point. So in order to be able to increase the success rate of these biopsies, uh, we are developing navigation principles, guiding principles for the pulmonologist to be able to successfully sample the correct target inside the, the body. So earlier, this is what the, 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 the doctors had to work with. They had the CT images from before the operation where they have the diagnostic CT. They can scroll through and look for the, the lesion and try to make a mental map of where to go inside the 3D structure. And the 3D structure is 
is rather complex because the lungs, they divide in two, 23 or more times. So it's, a, it's easy to get lost and it's easy to take a wrong left or right somewhere down the road and then get, uh, get into the wrong uh, airways and not be successful biopsy. So, so the, the image to the right is the, the live video image that they see during the procedure. So what we are uh, doing is using AI techniques to extract and detect and extract and classify all the different organs, uh, mainly the lung relevant organs, of course, uh, airways, lesions, lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are important if you want to determine uh, the, the severity of the cancer. So if it's spread, you have, uh, you have a positive detection on the other side of, uh, or the opposite side of the body, which is uh, important to find out uh, early on. So to, the, to detect and segment and classify these lymph nodes, this is really tricky. So one way is to, to segment all the other structures in addition, and then you, you are more easily can say with certainty which lymph nodes uh, belong where inside the, the body. So instead of showing just the 2D slice, you can show a virtual bronchoscopy before the procedure like this, where you basically give the doctor a fly through of the procedure going to the target. So then you can mentally prepare, okay, I'm gonna take a left and two rights, and then I'm gonna go into this branch. And if I instead go into this branch to the right, I get a more better access to the tumor and can sample it and, and then diagnose it afterwards. And when you have these, uh, these segmentations and in different visualization, you can do almost anything according to your fantasy, how to visualize it. This is just some examples. Up to the left, you can see that you're inside the airways, but you have made the airways uh, transparent. So you can see the lymph nodes on the outside uh, directly during your procedure. Uh, we are using tracking right now to track the bronchoscope as the, the procedure moves. But in the future, we see that we might be able to track the position using AI technology and the video image alone. This is an exciting feature and we have offered this as a master science uh, uh, project to, to the AI lab uh, for uh, the coming semester. So if you're interested, please uh, get in touch with me afterwards and we can talk more about that. Uh, in addition, we want to combine this with real-time imaging, which is very important in lymph node the staging. And, that, and for this, uh, we use ultrasound. The doctors use ultrasound to make sure that they get a sample from the, not only the correct lymph node, but also don't poke into any arteries or things like this. You can see a, a picture in the middle in the light blue area where you see the, the, the ultrasound probe. Uh, that they use and they have a needle coming out and entering the image that they can see where they, where they sample the probe. So we are trying to combine this ultrasound now into the, and co-register it with the CT and the PET CT so that the, the doctors have all the necessary knowledge in one place, in one screen during the procedure. That's the important part. And for ultrasound, we are actually, I would say that the, the team in, in Trondheim is internationally leading the way on AI and ultrasound. Uh, this is an example from a colleague of mine. Uh, his name is Eric Smista. He did a PhD at uh, the AI lab a few years back. And now he's, uh, he's, a, he's finished with his postdoc at the NTNU ISB at, uh, at the hospital. And he has made a, a very interesting platform called FAST where he can basically in real time do AI interpretation, detection and classification of features, structures in the ultrasound images. This is something we only a few years ago, we did not think this would be possible, but, uh, but now we are doing it in several clinical fields. And it's really uh, useful for learning to interpret ultrasound and to use ultrasound in practice for doctors. Uh, and also for experienced ones, they can get documentation of what they're doing. This is an example from uh, anesthesia, so nerve blocking, where you see uh, bone uh, vessels and the nerve bundle in yellow. It's a bit difficult to see in the middle of the image, but but just by showing this uh, in real time, annotated live to the doctor, you have a higher degree of security feeling, you have documentation, and as I said, you can do, use this for teaching purposes as well. And to be able to do this kind of uh, AI uh, real time work, we need to annotate the data, of course. This is the hard work of, of AI sometimes. Um, acquiring the data and annotating the data. We have something called the annotation web that we use for this purpose. Uh, it is a web link that, is, that can be sent to the doctor who, or the expert who does the annotation. 
and we set it up so that it's really simple to, to do with buttons and boxes, bonding boxes or, or points, and then you label these. And immediately everything that you do is saved, so you don't have to remember where you were, you don't have to do any tedious installation of any software or things like this. This is really out of the box in a web browser, useful for annotation work. Uh, if you want to know more about this, you can go to, to GitHub and have a look at the, the, the FAST framework. Uh, it's open source also. And we're using, there is some test data included there that Eric put out for, uh, for uh, students, et cetera, who wants to test and get started, familiarize themselves with this. So that, that was a short uh, and quick, I hope I didn't talk too fast and uh, happy to answer questions and discuss with you afterwards more examples if you want to know. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, uh, Thomas. We have uh, one question for you here. And the question is, uh, what? He has to stop share screen. Uh, OK. The question is, how far do you think we are from fully auto autonomous operations? And do you think we will ever reach it? Uh, I, I have some doubts that we will reach it. It would be fun. Uh, it would be interesting for some standardized procedures to, to do that and to explore that. but. I think task autonomy and assisting devices that work in a robotic fashion are the first step. And, uh, and please don't be misled by this uh, Da Vinci robot, which is not really a robot. Uh, it has some uh, robotic-like features. It can uh, filter uh, tremor. It can filter out movement, scale movement, zoom, auto zoom, and things like this. But it doesn't do anything that the surgeon doesn't do by the console. So. It's not really a robot, but uh, the only robot on the market now is a blood drawing robot. So it can draw okay. blood automatically. And the, the thing is with this robot is that it sees with optic, it sees with infrared below the surface for the vessels, and it uses ultrasound to verify where to poke the needle. And it's uh, it's been tested, I think it will, I don't know the number of cases, but it was better than humans actually. So it, it only needs one try every time. <laughs> That's the only robot uh, commercially available uh, that I know. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Very inspiring to hear your work. Thanks. Now, we, yes, thank you. Now we'll have a short break of five minutes. And after break, Jonathan Whitlock and Yula Sadler will have their presentations. So we will be back at 17.47.
I think we can wait one more minute to let everyone come back. Okay, I think we're good to go. Next up is Jonathan Whitlock from NTNU, and he will have a talk on neurophysiology and behavioral analysis. Cool. Um, is my screen sharing? Is that looking okay? Looking good. We're looking good. Perfect. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, I, I, I come as an ambassador from, uh, from, from neurophysiology. It was really comforting and, and fun to see the previous talks where the focus is more about, you know, the application of the technology as opposed to the technology itself. Um, because, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very much a consumer of, of AI, I don't develop myself. And by AI, I mean, broadly speaking, uh, a whole family of like uh, different machine learning tools that are out there now. So I'll talk a little bit about how we apply this in, in, in my line of work, specifically in my lab. And at the end, I'll, I'll give a few slides about how really like the, uh, the field as a whole is, is really benefiting hugely from um, advances in, uh, in uh, for example, computer vision, uh, pose estimation and, and the like. So the, the overarching goals, just most broadly speaking of behavioral neuroscience is to understand natural behavior um, of, of any animal, if it's a human or a monkey or a rodent, uh, to understand behavior without perturbing it. And at the other, at the same time, you wanna understand systems level neural computations. So how, you know, what, what the brain is doing. And you wanna put these elements together, the understanding of the brain and behavior together. Uh, so that you can build a more accurate model of, of how the brain generates behavior. You understand how behavior and experience and social interactions and whatnot, you know, feedback and shape the brain. And then in, 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 in the longer run, the longer sort of like over the horizon idea is that, you know, this will equip us to uh, generate, you know, more better on-target treatments, for example, of pharmacology um, or pharma pharmacological interventions, for example, with uh, psychiatric disease, right? Um, so more specifically, what, what, what my lab is interested in studying, one of our motivating questions is how does the brain coordinate action in, in space? And so what, why is this an interesting question? So it's an essential feature of daily life, uh, not just if you're learning to um, uh, uh, play baseball or basketball or what have you, but, um, you know, you, 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 you're, you know it's, it should seem intuitively obvious, right? Your, your brain is constantly driving your body and coordinating your body. Uh, for, for any number of actions that you do throughout the day, right? It's, it's, it's a continual job. Uh, so it's an essential feature of life. All animals do it. So any animal that has a body and a nervous system, um, which is most of life, um, you know, has, has a brain that has to drive a body. And so in this case, the animal uh, is reaching through a narrow, narrow slit, it's grabbing a pellet, pulling it in and eating it. And this is from a, a series of experiments where we were recording neural populations in the animal's cortex. And then relating this, relating the patterns of activity back to the animal's behavior and seeing how the cortex organized the, uh, the, the, the representations for the animal's actions. And again, the, the, the more that we understand these things, um, uh, for example, uh, we can build uh, a better prosthetics, uh, we can build uh, uh, robotics, uh, robots that, that move better. Um, yeah, so this is kind of the, the basic idea. Um, uh, uh, the motivation for my group's work. And I'll, I'll just say that there, there's really two dominant approaches uh, over the decades that have sort of guided the study of, of uh, the uh, behavior in the brain. So the older one, and it's been incredibly productive uh, over the decades, is using very strict control and studying very simple behavior. So in this case, the animal's head fixed, it's sitting in a chair, it's head restrained, there's a microdrive that's recording cells uh, from the animal's uh, part of the brain called the posterior parietal cortex. And the animal's responding to various visual signals and it's reaching out to certain spatial locations and it's performing specific actions. Um, so the behavior here is very restrained, but it's, you know, it's very precise, it's very repeatable. Um, 
And this technology is improved. Now it's possible to use a markerless tracking or to fit lots of markers on an animal's arm and study uh, you know, with great precision the, the trajectory of the, of the movement through 3D space, right? So that's one camp. The other camp is to um, basically record less of the animal's behavior. So you have less control over the animal's behavior, uh, but you can let the animal behave naturally, right? So in this case, you have a miniaturized drive that just weighs a couple of grams that's fitting on a, a mouse's head. Uh, so the animal can carry the drive around with it as it's behaving and, and doing what it does. Um, you can target those electrodes to wherever you want, whatever area of interest in the brain uh, you may seek. And here's just an example video of this kind of approach where, the, again, the animal's running freely. It's just that less is being tracked. That's the point here. And um, the cell I'm going to show you is, is from the animal's brain region called the hippocampus. This is called a uh, place cell. So if you can hear the popping, it's that the cell fires whenever the animal is in that northwest corner of the box. Which is really cool to see play out in, in, in real time. But you, You see the spikes are going off in the northwest corner of the box, but the thing is you, you don't really have a view of, of, of the animal's behavior. It's changing, it's, it, it, it's sniffing around, it's turning, it's curling its body, it's stretching out. You lose all of that information uh, when you simplify the account of the animal's behavior, right? So you have this kind of like give and take, all right, between uh, control versus freedom. And my group has been working for some years to try to kind of fill that gap, fill that middle ground. Um, by recording from free to behaving animals, but tracking them in 3D, right? So this is the work of my, uh, for one of my first PhD students, Bartul Mimica, my first postdoc, Ben Dunn, who is now um, uh, associate professor up in the math department. And so here we track the animals' backs and heads with retroflective markers, put a ring of, of infrared cameras up above them and track them at 120 hertz. And the data sets that we collect from the animals now, it's, you know, as opposed to the previous video where you just have one camera overhead, when you're using multiple cameras, you can zoom in on the animal's behavior. You can uh, recreate basically a behavioral session. You see the animal here has a, it has a head, a neck, and a back. And um, it just gives a much, much more intuitive kind of feel for, um, you know, what is the animal doing? What, you know, what's its actual behavior? Not just where is it, but, but what's the animal actually doing? And so here's an example of the setup actually in action. So. There are, uh, these are the markers you see floating in orange on the animal's back. The sound is, is very faint, but there's a faint popping that you hear. There's a picture of it. There's a cell up in the animal's frontal motor cortex that's being isolated. That waveform that you see corresponds to the spiking activity of a single cell. And here's the rat that's running around and, and, and freely behaving, right? They're marked up. They tolerate the markers pretty well. Um, <clears throat> right, so what this allows us now to do is instead of just looking at the animal's location, we can look at the animal's body posture. So the pitch of the head, the pitch of the back, neck elevation, back azimuth, head azimuth, head roll. So we, we have a much, much richer account of the animal's posture. And I'll show you an example now of, of uh, what I would just call like a right, a right turn cell. It's a very simple sort of moniker to put on it. So th this animal is freely running around the box, but here for the sake of, of the... Um, uh, demonstration for the video, the animals being held in place artificially, computationally, using a code we call Mr. Stuck Animals. Um, but I hope that you can hear the popping of the cell and that it's kind of obvious uh, when the cell is firing, what's going on with the animal's body. So, so look, looking at the animal using the old school kind of technique of just having the camera overhead, you might see that it corresponds to when the animal's running off to the right. But here in the video, you can see that it's actually, the, it's, it's not just the, the movement of the animal, it's the posture of the animal. And in fact, it's the posture that's the main explainer um, uh, that, that accounts for the variability in the cell spiking. So here's a, a, a tuning curve for the head azimuth of the animal. So the left, right displacement of the animal's head. So whenever the animal's head is, is turning off to the right, um, these colored dots here correspond to the firing rate of the cell at different points in time during the recording. And you see there's this 
really what it's a very nice tuning curve where the, the peak of the firing rate is, is several standard deviations above the, uh, the null distribution, which is shown by the error bars down beneath. Uh, we see the same thing now for considering the animal's uh, back for the azimuth of the back, again, when it's turned off to the right. And we also see the same thing for the uh, animal's head roll. Uh, this cell also fired a little bit when the animal's head was rolled a, a bit to the left. And this all looks tidy and good, but then, you know, we got what we asked for, and it was a, a bit overwhelming because it was just this white wall of death of, of possible covariates that could explain the firing properties of these cells. Right, so um, so this was a bit intimidating, and, and now you might be able to see, okay, there, there really is a need for statistical models and maybe someday machine learning uh, to make sense of all the data that we're getting. So we, for now, we, we, we tamed this, this so-called death by covariates using uh, generalized linear models or GLMs to uh, basically build a picture of how posture was represented in the brain. So. So looking at a part of the brain that, again, it, it deals with uh, coordinating the, the, the positioning of the body in space. Um, for, for example, um, we've known since the 70s that parietal cortex is involved in controlling an animal's arm movement or eye position. And what we showed here in this study was that um, if you unhook the animal and let it run freely, actually most of what parietal cortex cares about is uh, the 3D posture of the animal's head that you just, you wouldn't know that, you wouldn't see it unless you were tracking the animal in 3D. Uh, I cared about other aspects of the body as well, the neck elevation, the uh, back posture. Um, some cells cared about all of these, uh, all of these features altogether. And then there were the, uh, the uh, so-called un unclassified cells, which I kind of like because it means we need to track more and uh, uh, there's more work for us to do. And <clears throat> I'll just say it's roughly the same story looking up at the frontal motor areas that parietal cortex connects with. And, and that's all well and good, right? And so if we have nice tracking and we have GLMs, um, you know, this, uh, this is about as far as we can get, but the, you know, no one wants to stop there. Um, so the idea is to really, you know, get at the neural tuning to behavior itself, not just the physical attributes of behavior, but what was the animal doing? What was it doing? Um, what was it doing, you know, uh, one second ago, what's it going to do next? Can you build up generative models um, based on the animal's time varying behavior and use behavior to predict behavior and also incorporate neural activity, see how the brain is generating this. So now we really need to rely on, on things like dimensionality reduction. Um, other labs are using machine learning based approaches to extracting time varying uh, behaviors from, from postural data. So um, I should also note that this is being spearheaded in my group by Claudia Battistin. Uh, who's a postdoc uh, also in the math department uh, in, in Ben Dunn's lab. And so, so she takes the, the 3D pose data that we collect from the animals, um, it does a, a morelet wavelet decomposition to basically uh, take the different postural features and look at how quickly they're changing through time. Um, and uh, uh, to, to have a record for how each of the postural features is changing through time. Yeah, that's basically what you're doing with the, with the, with the wavelet decomposition. Then you take this decomposed uh, uh, time frequency data and you do low dimensional embedding like PCA, um, uh, something uh, you can also use nonlinear embedding, uh, T-SNE for, uh, for visualization purposes. And then you, you include watershed clustering and now what each of these different patches corresponds to is um, uh, it's a different behavior that the animal is doing. And this, this map is basically, again, it's, it, it's built out of time varying posture, right? So if the animal is, is reared up uh, high or scanning with its head up, or if it's preparing to rear, uh, these different behaviors are, are captured, they're embedded, and then you know, labeled uh, post hoc uh, by the experimenter. And now you can make videos of uh, all of these different behaviors uh, that the animals are doing. And so they kind of slow down a little bit when each of the identified behaviors pops up. So if the animal's rearing or if it's straight running, if it has its head turned in a certain way when it's walking. Um, and and to, to someone who studies behavior and who wants to understand how the brain generates behavior, this, this, this is huge. I mean, this, this really opens up a big door um, because now, we're not just taking a static image of the animal's posture and, and, and making a simple tuning curve, but now we can ask about how is the brain generating exact behaviors with pretty good precision on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, right, when the animal's freely moving. 
And for decades, this has required that the animal is head fixed and doing this task that you usually, a very, something very artificial that you take weeks to train the animal to do. And now we can identify these individual behaviors, we can pull them out and look at the different brain networks that are generating them and see how they're working together. All right, so we can look at uh, uh, this in, in individual uh, freely moving animals. We can ask, uh, does it matter what task the animal was doing? Does, uh, does the animal's um, uh, behavioral syntax matter? Does, that, that means, you know, what, what was the animal doing before? What's it gonna do next? What's the context of, the, of this given action that the animal's doing? Uh, another thing I'd like to use this tool to study is, is the, the effects of, of social interactions between animals. So uh, this is very much uh, ongoing. And what I'll do now is, is, is kind of relate this type of work back to, to, to other work that's going on in the field. So um, deep learning, for example. Uh, so I was just talking about you know, dimensionality reduction techniques that were kind of stacked together one by one. Uh, but deep learning has been applied to successfully model human movement. Um, years years ago, back in the 2000s. So these two videos um, that are playing up at the top are actually not videos of people, but these are the outputs of generative models uh, that were trained um, on a, a couple of hundred frames of human movement. Um, so the, uh, the, the, the joint angle information um, from human videos is, is in this case plugged in as inputs to a restricted Boltzmann machine. And the, uh, the joint angles as an animal or an animal, as a person moves and walks, they vary through time. So the, the hidden nodes get trained up based on the, the uh, time varying joint angles that the person has as they, as they walk or move. And then the, the output of this, uh, of this uh, RBM is uh, the, the different types of movement that the person is executing, right? So if you look at the hidden nodes kind of stretched out through time here, um, you can just look at the pace at which the hidden nodes are, are, are changing and you can get a sense for if, if a person was doing a behavior at a moderate pace like walking or if they were sitting still, uh, if they get back up and, uh, and so on. So this is an incredibly powerful tool. We actually wanted to use this in the first place um, for our animal data, but we found out that we could actually get away with using much, much simpler uh, techniques, which is what I showed on the previous slide. Um, uh, similar approaches have been used. This is from uh, Bob Dada's lab, uh, behavioral neurophysiology group at, at, at Harvard, where uh, they were using simple depth sensors that were placed above an arena that has mice running in it. And you take the, uh, the outline of the mouse, the hull of the mouse, and you look how it changes during the course of uh, uh, just running around and exploring uh, in an open arena. Uh, you take the tracking data, do PCA on it, uh, you feed the PCA output into uh, an, uh, an autoencoder, and uh, you're able to extract individual behaviors, right? So uh, each one of these circles here corresponds to one of the different behaviors that was extracted um, from an animal behaving perfectly spontaneously. Um, and you can isolate them. And again, you can start to ask questions about what, what are the different uh, systems in the brain that, that, that work together to produce this kind of behavior, right? Um, and there's a continually growing zoo of machine learning methods for classifying behavior. So there were three different examples here, but there's many. Um, they've been developed in fruit flies, in mice, and in rodents. And some of the cool early stuff was, uh, was uh, originally done in humans. And um, the last thing I mentioned is, is in, in a parallel development in convolutional neural nets. Uh, they've gotten better. Uh, access to high power GPUs and the like has been democratized. And this has really led to an explosion of, of markerless tracking tools. And so I'm showing some examples here from a tracking toolkit called Deep Lab Cut. It's one of the most uh, commonly widely available ones now, although of course there are many. Um, and the user basically just, you just label a, a few dozen frames uh, and the model learns to predict what it thinks your object of interest is, and it can uh, track individual movements um, with very little training. So here's, again, here's a rat that's reaching through a narrow slit, grabbing a pellet of food. You can see that the different knuckles and, and digits of the animal's paw are labeled very nicely. Here's uh, an example of studying locomotor behavior with an animal that is uh, running on a running wheel. Um, there's a postdoc in my lab, Yurnea, who is using uh, uh, head-mounted cameras so that we can track the animal's eyes and whiskers. And we're taking this markerless tracking data and actually piping it back onto 
the, uh, the 3D model, the 3D rat that I was showing before. Um, so now that thing has eyes and whiskers and we can start to study how it, it, it uses its, its sensory input to guide, guide its behavior to do that quantitatively. Um, it's possible to visualize collective behaviors, right? And so this is a hard problem to crack for a long time, which is that you have animals, this is a zebrafish that are swimming in a tank. For a long time, it was very hard to tell one animal apart from another, but again, things have improved. Um, and this allows you to look at the behavior, not only of one animal, but, but groups of animals. And this is a, a, a thing from, from Ian Cousin's lab at the Max, uh, Max Planck in Konstanz in Germany. Uh, it's called T-Rex, it just came out last month. And these guys even went so far with these different colors here to project what they think the, uh, what the animal is seeing, right? Based on, uh, based on the, the eye position of the fish. And as with many things, this fantastic collection of toolkits started with early work with people. Right, so here's a, a, a video of a group of dancers. I think this was in Switzerland. Um, and uh, um, this was an early demonstration, I think of a software called MoDeep, but since then there have been uh, uh, Deep Pose and, and several other uh, convolutional uh, uh, neural nets that have been uh, developed over the years. As of 2020, there's more than 4,000 papers that have uh, been published on, on human pose estimation. Right, so then uh, again, just to sum up the overarching goals for behavioral neuroscience is for the part about understanding natural behavior without perturbing it, with advances in tracking and machine vision and, and behavioral modeling, we're, we're, we're in the middle of kind of a renaissance uh, where we can track uh, more and more sophisticated features, you know, almost by the month. Uh, so it's a very, very fun time to be doing this. Um, and on the, on, on, on the neuro, on, on the, the brain end, uh, there's additional work that's going on with uh, uh, collecting ever larger uh, uh, samplings of population data and modeling that. So then these things can be brought together using dimensionality reduction, statistical modeling. Some groups are starting to use deep neural networks to unite behavioral and neural data sets. Um, and again, you know, this is done in the service of, of better understanding how the, uh, the brain generates behavior. Um, so thanks for your attention. And I need to acknowledge Ben and Bartul and Claudia who made the work possible for the work that I showed from, from my own group and my funding sources the Norwegian Research Council and uh, the ERC. So thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Jonathan. We have some uh, questions for you and we will pick uh, two of them. Okay. So the first, first question is, what do you think of Elon Musk's Neuralink project. Uh, a, a short, a, a short answer for that is, um, I, I you ask him when's it gonna get going, when's it gonna get cool, and he says about ten years. And you'll ask him that in five years or ten years, and you'll ask him, okay, when's it gonna get going, when's it gonna get cool, and he's gonna say about ten years. I think that, I, that I'll just leave it at that. We can discuss it at more length afterwards. But I think this is. I, I think that requires solving some seriously big problems that, you know, just, just hiring a bunch of engineers and throwing them at it is, is it, you're not going to figure out how the brain works that way. Unfortunately, it's, it's harder than that. <laughs> All right. The next question um, is, does the sensors on the rat's head affect its movement? Well, we want to, we, we, yeah, that's a great question, of course. Um, yeah, so, so we, we, we want to minimize that kind of thing um, as much as possible. Um, I, I mean, yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, we would use the sensors to study how the animal uses its senses in, in different situations, if it's meeting a new animal or if it's, um, in a new room for the first time, or if it's if it's encountering an object that it didn't expect, and in my group is just starting with this. So now I'm quoting previous uh, 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 previous work. So so we have benchmarks that we'll be able to um, uh, compare our data up against to see just how natural the animal's behavior is. But I can say, particularly when you're using rats, which are um, as far as rodents go, are large. They have strong necks. Uh, they can actually tolerate the headgear quite well, and they will engage in, in chasing behaviors and social behaviors quite well. The only thing you have to watch out for is that if you have groups of animals together that they don't rip the stuff or start chewing on the, on the parts on the, on the other animal's head. But uh, no, I mean, and I, you know, we can discuss this, this more in the forum afterwards too. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Jonathan. Great, thanks. Okay, I'll so uh, stop sharing my screen or let's see, let me come back here.